Thank you for coming. Oh, you're so sweet to come. Oh my God, you're so, you're so nice. Hey, how are you? You look fantastic. All right, nice to see everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, <coughs> Thank you. I'm going to try this again. I'm Martha Cutter, and thanks to everybody for coming. This is the second to the last brown bag talk of faculty work this semester. I have a flyer for our next upcoming talk, which is Greg Perot, who will be talking about the Black Avenger, a Western tradition of novelty. So I think that'll be really interesting and exciting. I'll pass around this flyer. And, um, What's published on more skits? Exactly. Excellent. Thank you, um, And um, so I have the privilege of introducing our dear colleague, Claire Eby, today. And then she will talk, as uh, I introduce her. So Claire Eby's research has centered on the progressive error, and it has always had a strong interdisciplinary <coughs> component. Her most recent book, which is called Until Choice Do Us Part, Marriage Reform in the Progressive Era, was published in the University of Chicago Press's history series, a very impressive series, difficult to get into. I think I wrote that letter and editor at one point, and he just laughed at me. He's like, ha oh, ha ha, Cutter, you're such a neo my book. <laughs> Seriously. Um, anyway, Claire is also, that was a while ago, though. Was younger. Anyway, Claire is also the author of Dreiser and Veglund, Sabotars of the Status Quo, which came out from University of Missouri Press in... A long time ago. A long time ago, okay. <laughs> she edited the Dreiser edition of The Genius, bringing to print for the first time Dreiser's original version of his most autobiographical novel based on the holograph manuscript. And she also edited the Norton Critical Edition of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. She is also co-editor of the Cambridge History of the American Novel, which is a great volume, and the Cambridge Companion to Dreiser, which is also a wonderful volume. Uh, several years ago, Claire became frustrated by having no time to keep up with contemporary novels she wrote me, and decided to w make work into play by signing up to teach courses in recent American fiction. So her talk today is drawn from her current research, and it marks Claire's efforts to reinvent herself as a scholar of contemporary literature and the law. So I think we all look forward to this talk, and let's give Claire a big Thank you. So many people turn out at this insanely busy time of year. And a special thanks to Martha for inviting me and for her expert organizational and PR efforts um, on, on all of our behalf. So as my former students in the room know, I'm pretty obsessed with the corporate form. And this all started during my last sabbatical. I was reading about, the, around at the same time, Citizens United, the 2010 decision, which gave, extended the free speech rights of corporations by allowing them to pour unlimited money into elections. And also Richard Powers' gain, which traces the history of a corporation over, over several centuries. Um, so it, this is a sort of conjunction that can only happen while on sabbatical when we actually have time to indulge in idle curiosity and not just frantically prepare for classes and write for, for deadlines. And reading these two texts together very much inspired my current um, book project on corporate personhood. So what I aim to do is to bring literature and the law together to show the ethical and epistemological crises caused by the corporate person's non-accountability to the human person. So my overarching argument, which is still in very preliminary stages, is that corp corporate personhood provides a dangerous framework for extending rights to corporations, and in doing so, it diminishes the rights of actual human <coughs> citizens. And that's what I mean by the, by the zero-sum game. So Citizens United's 5-4 decision infuriated me, but I was electrified by Justice Stevens' dissent. He argued that corporations don't deserve free speech rights because they aren't human, and he made the refreshingly obvious point, and I quote, that corporations have no consciences, no beliefs, no feelings, no thoughts, no desires. So it's differences like that between the corporate and the human person that interest me, 
and contemporary fiction spotlights these differences in many different ways. In Gain, for instance, the Powers novel, the narrative takes the form of a buildings roman, only the protagonist is a humble family-owned soap maker in colonial America that comes of age as a massive consumer goods conglomerate in the late 20th century. This company enjoying a centuries-long lifespan is named, conveniently enough, the Clare Corporation. So I was, de I was destined to write this project. It is. It's, it's spelled the right way, I might say. So while on one hand, Gain is a postmodern spoof, the building's Roman form also makes readers think seriously about how a corporate life cycle is and is not like that of humans. So Powers identifies the day that Claire incorporates in 1857 as a milestone. Once the company becomes what Powers calls one composite body, it also becomes a, quote, protected person, unquote. Those protections include such legally granted privileges as limited liability and immortality, which give Claire advantages over human persons. The other Claire, not me. As Ambrose Bierce quipped in the Devil's Dictionary, corporation, an ingenious device for ob obtaining individual profit without individual responsibility. So after Claire incorporates, it starts changing from protagonist to antagonist. And this new identity emerges, of course, only in relation to human characters. Throughout Gain, Claire's robust life story runs alongside a far more human story of frailty, illness, and death. Residing in the Midwestern city where the company is headquartered in the late 20th century, Laura Bodie is dying of cancer that is probably caused by Claire products and or by its environmental pollutants. Probably, but not conclusively caused. Uh, the crucial point is that Claire cannot be proven to have caused Laura's cancer. And even if it could be proven, what good would it do? Laura would still die and the company survive whatever fines or penalties a court ordered. And then in a crucial scene, Laura's former husband sneaks into the headquarters and makes his way to the company's nerve center, the boardroom. He fantasizes about throwing a bomb, only to realize that the destruction of company property, or even killing off a number of executives, would do absolutely no good. It would not harm Claire in the least. So the problem that Powers I I identifies is that while humans have created the corporate form and endowed it with all kinds of special privileges, the corporation can literally get away with murder. A Lord Chancellor captured this dilemma perfectly in the late 18th century when he noted that a corporation has no, no soul to damn and no body to kick. So it's, it's the law and specifically the legal doctrine of corporate personhood that gives corporations power over humans and unaccountability to us. And the legal history actually extends for centuries before C Citizens United. So this gets a little bit hazy. But I'm going to talk uh, now a little bit about legal fictions and metaphors before speeding through a few landmark Supreme Court decisions. This is not the place for extended close readings of legal rationales, but I'll try to give some sense of how the court actually contradicts itself repeatedly in upholding the rights of corporate persons. So I will then sketch the arguments of the two chapters I have drafted, and finally, much more briefly, explain the other two that I have planned. So legal scholars and justices describe corporate personhood as a legal fiction. The phrase legal construct might make more sense to us, but the fact that lawyers admit corporate personhood is a fiction is, of course, very provocative for a literary scholar. While lawyers rarely talk about it this way, corporate personhood is also, of course, a metaphor, which one of my reference books describes as a comparison that's not actually articulated as a comparison. So in other words, corporations are not people but corporate person, personhood pretends that they are like people without, of course, uttering the word like. So a simile would actually be a lot more honest. The fact that the metaphor doesn't actually articulate a comparison helps to sustain the fiction that corporations are like humans, and the fiction, in turn, sustains considerable du duplicity. So there are two levels of duplicity embedded in this legal fiction of corporate personhood that I'm concerned with. First, even if corporations resemble humans in some ways, for instance, both can enter into contracts or be sued, 
they decidedly do not resemble us in many other ways. They have no conscience, no beliefs, no feelings, and so on. But the metaphor of corporate personhood obscures those differences as it pretends an absolute equivalence. Second, it's only because corporations are understood as like people in the first place that they can claim constitutional rights. So corporate personhood has also become a pillar of neoliberalism, and we can see that by examining how the court's rationale in Citizens United is predicated on two additional metaphors, um, I would say toxic <coughs> met metaphors, economic metaphors. One of them that the court relies on is the idea that money is a form of speech, which I just think is outrageous. Um, Justice Kennedy, writing for the majority, is fond of emphasizing that the Constitution protects free speech, not free speakers. So I suppose that means it protects money itself, not the people who have money. So while I'm not a fan of originalist interpretations, I am pretty confident that the founders did not actually think of money as protected speech. So the second toxic neoliberal metaphor that Citizens United enshrines is what Kennedy calls the marketplace of ideas, which makes me really crazy. Um, which, and this marketplace of idea theoretically permits every interested party to contribute her two cents during an election season. The problem, of course, is that while you or I may in fact contribute two cents, the Koch brothers can contrib contribute two millions through corporate venues. So this incommensurability illustrates how the corporate person has become the neoliberal person par excellence. Neoliberalism de denies that material differences of access, class position, race, ethnicity, or gender give any economic player advantage over another. According to neoliberalism, we're all equals in the marketplace of ideas. Except that, to borrow a phrase from Orwell, some people are more equal than others, which is precisely what the legal fiction of corporate personhood allows. Excuse me, just very serious cotton mouth today. Um, probably caffeine is good. Well, actually, no, water would be great. Thank you so much. So how did we get to this point? I'm primarily interested in contemporary iterations of corporate personhood, but law is, of course, based on precedent. And in order to understand this legal fiction, I need not simply to examine British law, out of which US law emerged, but also canon law, where I'm really out of my league. My understanding is that the earliest iterations of, of, of uh, corporate law go back to the church as a corporate body. And there's also a long tradition of understanding municipalities and universities as corporate bodies. So the idea of a persona ficta goes back at least to Pope Innocent IV. According to legal historian Morton Horwitz, however, the origins of corporate personhood in the US lie in a fascinating treatise called Political Theories of the Middle Ages, written by a German scholar, Otto Gerke, and translated into English in 1900. So what all this means is that in order to talk about the last 10 years or so, I have to go back at least as far as the Middle Ages. And I welcome your thoughts about how to handle this, um, because I do, do not intend for this to be a multi-volume endeavor. Um, but my working assumption is that I'm going to have an introductory chapter, which is going to provide sort of a telescoped history somehow. Um, or perhaps I can farm that out. Um, but anyway, so American legal writing about corporations, including Supreme Court decisions, draw from a large array of terms which are not used consistently. And I'm going to try not to try to simplify these terms as much as possible. But there are theories about the corporation as artificial, others about it as fictitious, and considerable debate as to whether it is a, quote, real entity, unquote, at all. But broadly speaking, American law has developed three different theories of the relationship between corporations and humans, which I will now sketch for you very briefly. Is this Spike, Martha? <laughs> So, so the first theory is called the concession theory, and this prevailed through mo most of the 19th century. So this was before there were general laws of incorporation, and so every, each corporation was created by a distinct legislative act. And so in other words, the state had to concede its existence. Um, a decision um, called Trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward in 1819 exemplifies this first theory. Chief Justice John Marshall said, a corporation is an artificial being existing only in contemplation of law. 
Now, what may surprise modern listeners is that Marshall takes for granted that the corporation will also be, in his words, beneficial to the country. That's because until the late 19th century, incorporation would be conceded only if an institution would serve some clear public benefit. Justice Marshall also describes the corporation as having individuality, but as legal scholar Elizabeth Pullman explains, that's a far cry from treating it as an actual legal person. She and others point out that under the concession theory, the now common notion of corporations having rights, much less constitutional rights, would, would be preposterous. So states began passing general incorporation laws in the late 19th century, and so incorporation became a lot more routine, and so it no longer seemed to be the special privilege conceded by the state. So at this point, a second legal understanding of the corporation evolved called the aggregate theory, um, under which the for-profit organization assumes status as an actual legal person. So the idea that a corporation consists of the aggregate total of the individuals who comprise it, this opens the door for claiming constitutional protection because it can then be argued that defending the rights of the individual humans making up a corporation ne necessitates perfect protecting the rights of the corporation itself. So personally, I don't see how the aggregate theory squares with democratic principles. It sounds to me like one person getting two votes, but this is the rationale. So in, in any case, the aggregate theory crystallized in a landmark case of 1886, Santa Clara, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, which some of you have read. Attorneys for the railroad successfully argued that tax assessors discriminated in charging their client higher rates on land than what human persons paid. So in doing so, they pulled off one of the greatest outrages in the history of US law because they grounded their case on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which was, of course, one of the Reconstruction Amendments intended to protect former slaves. As if that were not contemptible enough, in the first 50 years after Santa Clara, when the Supreme Court invoked the 14th Amendment, over half of the time it was to extend the rights of corporate persons and fewer than one half of 1% to protect African Americans. So the third legal theory of the corporation as a so-called real entity developed in the early 20th century. According to this interpretation, the corporation is an independent entity with an existence apart from both owners and state. In an often cited 1911 Harvard Law Review article, Arthur Macon asserts that while a corporation may be artificial, it's also quite real, which he explained by way of another analogy. An artificial lake, he said, is still a real lake because you can swim in it, unlike in an imaginary lake, which you cannot swim in. Likewise, Macon argues, and I quote, although corporate personality is a fiction, the entity which is personified is no fiction. So corporate personality is therefore, he concludes, a fiction founded upon fact. Gets a little head splitting. Contemporary legal scholar Susanna Ripkin sums up the practical consequences of this real entity theory very nicely. She says, as a whole that, that is greater than the sum of its parts, the corporation is a real person qualitatively different in kind from the human persons who are part of its makeup. So I know I don't need to sell a group of humanities scholars on the importance of history. But the legal history of corporate personhood has had extremely practical consequences because the court draws from these three theoretical models, concession, aggregate, and real entity theory, in quite inconsistent ways. Taken together, they are entirely illogical. So to illustrate the point, I now turn to a 2014 decision that builds on Citizens United and maybe even more pernicious, Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, which extends corporate rights to the realm of religious freedom. So in Hobby Lobby, the Department of Health and Human Services filed suit against three corporations owned by Christians who had denied day after contraceptive coverage to female employees, and they cited religious objections <coughs> to abortion, and they considered this an abortifacient. So Health and Human Services claimed, and I think correctly, that the corporations thus violated the Affordable Care Act mandate 
to provide preventative health care. But in another 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court agreed with the corporate lawyers that providing day after medication violated the corporate owner's religious beliefs. So my monograph includes a chapter on Hobby Lobby, which I read through and alongside of Mohsen Hamid's brilliant 2007 novel, The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And I argue that capitalism has become the United States' signature brand of fundamentalism and that the faith is sustained by the legal fiction of corporate personhood. Before returning to Hobby Lobby, I should briefly explain what I mean about capitalist fundamentalism. So Hofstadter describes the core tenet of the fundamentalist mind, whether secular or religious, as beginning with a definition of that which is absolutely right and then looking at the world only through that lens. So I think a similar sense of inerrancy has become the default assumption regarding capitalism, which is widely assumed to be not only the superior, but also the inevitable way to structure the economy. Advocates of both capitalist and religious fundamentalism consider their respective views to be infallible, universal, and commonsensical truths accessible to anyone who opens their eyes. Both groups gravitate toward Manichaean interpretations and disregard cultural or historical differences. Moreover, with the spread of neoliberalism, capitalism has become evangelical, using mechanisms like the IMF and the World Bank to dis disperse its dogma across the globe. But it was the reluctant fundamentalist that got me thinking about capitalist fundamentalism in the first place. The entire novel is something of a Rorschach blot, playing with readers' presumptions about Islamic fundamentalism. But in a crucial scene, the protagonist and narrator, a Pakistan-born and Princeton-educated Wall Street analyst named Changez, is instructed by a colleague to focus on the fundamentals, which basically means to keep his eye on the bottom line. While much has been written about how the reluctant fundamentalist engages complicated questions of identity and nation, I'm interested in how the fundamentalism practiced by Changez's firm, which he correctly identifies as a creed, fosters the zero-sum game, placing the interests of corporations over those of humans. So only such a cultural climate as Hamid sketches one that literally worships capitalism, could generate the Hobby Lobby decision. In extending religious rights to corporations, Samuel Alito, writing for the majority, draws inconsistently from the three theories of corporate identity that I sketched above, the concession, aggregate, and real entity theories. Explicitly, though, he only references one of them, because if he, if he explicitly referenced all three, the house of cards would come falling down. So the one that he references is the late 19th century aggregate theory. He refers to what he calls the familiar legal fiction of corporate personhood, and he says, it is important to keep in mind that the purpose of this fiction is to provide protection for human beings. Um, and so that is basically aggregate theory 101, because it's saying the corporation consists of those individuals in it, and so, be, and so in order to, to protect those individuals, we have to protect the rights of the corporation. Um, but the Hobby Lobby ru ruling also draws piecemeal from the two other theories of corporations, and this is where it starts to become inco incoherent. So Alito admits that a corporation can't pray or worship, yet he claims the organization can still have religious objectives. So if you go to the Hobby Lobby webpage, for instance, you can find, in addition to a 30% off coupon, um, that the corporation is committed to honoring the Lord in all we do by operating the company in a manner consistent with biblical principles and also providing a return on the family's investment, sharing the Lord's blessings with our employees. So such corporate statements, I guess, are evidence of the actual religion of the corporation. But if the problem here is that if a corporation itself and not just its owners can pursue religious objectives, then that would actually make it a real and independent entity, qualitatively different at, from and independent of its owners, which would mean that it couldn't be this aggregate being after all. Um, Alito doesn't admit that he's drawing from this, the real entity theory as well, because doing so would invalidate his premise of protecting the religious expression of the owners enabled by the aggregate theory. So most bizarrely, Alito also draws upon the earliest model 
the early 19th century concession theory. He says, modern corporate law does not require for-profit corporations to pursue profit at the expense of everything else. Corporations, in his account, are marvelous shapeshifters, one moment for-profit, another not-for-profit. And in, in describing the charitable and humanitarian causes on which corporations voluntarily spend their profits, Alito updates the 19th century concession theory, according to which the corporation serves vital civic functions. But there's an important difference. Alito's 21st century corporation doesn't do so because it, it has to in order to be recognized by the state. His kinder and gentler corporate entity does good because it chooses to do so. So as in Citizens United, in Hobby Lobby, a quantifiable corporate expense, in, in the case of, of Citizens United, political contributions, in the case of Hobby Lobby, philanthrop philanthropic donations, these quantifiable corporate expenses are used to claim intangible constitutional rights. While I find the logic contemptible, the consequence is even worse. Hobby Lobby extends zero-sum game because affirming the corporate person's constitutional free exercise of religion permits the court to deny flesh and blood women employees their statutory right to ACA mandated coverage. So the, the reluctant fundamentalist clarifies how prioritizing corporations becomes the pretext for ignoring labor. The protagonist, Changez, is a star financial analyst whose job is to determine the value of client companies. He says at one point, our mandate was to determine how much fat could be cut through headcount reduction and other measures. So the bureaucratic euphemisms are frightening, and so is his response. I felt enormously powerful, he recalls. Would these workers be fired? We, indirectly, of course, would help decide. So Changas explains that his job leaves no time for sympathy. To be perfectly honest, he says, the compassionate pangs I felt for soon to be redundant workers were not overwhelming in their frequency. Our job required a degree of commitment that left one with rather limited time for such distractions. So this is the logical consequence of the zero-sum game. Actual human beings are reduced to distractions. So I hope I've given you some sense of how, founded on this legal fiction of personhood and supported by two centuries of Supreme Court rulings, the corporation has come to enjoy a peculiar status of privileged yet disembodied personhood against which human persons do not stand a chance, as well as how literature can help dramatize the problems. But the only two literary texts I know that that provide sustained examinations of corporate personhood per se are Powers' novel Gain that I spoke about earlier and a 2014 volume of poetry by Jenna Osman called Corporate Relations. And like Powers, Osman is very well versed in e the economic and legal history of corporations. She actually quotes from Supreme Court decisions throughout the volume. The opening poem titled The Beautiful Life of Persona Ficta draws attention to the incommensurability of human and corporate persons through wonderful lines like these. A corporation says, hey, I'm talking to you, as an individual speaks through a spokesperson. Or, a corporation has an enthusiasm for ethical behavior as a creature has economic interests only. Or, my favorite, a corporation warms the bed and wraps its arms around you and just wants to spoon as a natural human wants to organize profits. <laughs> but without specifically engaging corporate personhood, many other novels expose the zero-sum game by spotlighting the excesses of corporations while offering briefs for normative humanity. And I think it's not a coincidence that so many of these are actually dystopias. Um, including Atwood's Oryx and Crake, Chang Ray Lee's On Such a Full Sea, Steingart's Super Sad True Love Story, and Helen Phillips' The Beautiful Bureaucrat, and also of course, Dave Eggers' The Circle. I hope to write about all of these. Um, so I've also drafted a chapter on the idea of corporate immortality and Super Sad True Love Story. And I know it's, the immortality thing sounds really weird, but this is actually one of the specific um, attributes that the law understands as unique to corporations. Limited liability being, being of course, an, uh, being of course another. Um, so the idea of corporate immortality reaches back at least into medieval canon law. First religious institutions, then boroughs, municipalities, and guilds. 
and then universities were theorized as corporate bodies that could exist in perpetuity. So a primary benefit of incorporation was the ability to transmit property over generations. So British common law continued this tradition. Blackstone famously called the corporation a person that never dies. Within US law, corporate immortality is enshrined in Dartmouth, the, the 1819 case I discussed above. Um, as Justice Marshall explained in Dartmouth, corporate immortality allows for a perpetual succession of individuals capable of acting for the promotion of the particular object like one immortal being. So in other words, what this meant was that benefactors of Dartmouth could be assured that their donations would remain with the college in perpetuity. So I don't object to the logic of these early rationales for corporate immortality, all of which had in mind, as you will see, as you could see, specifically nonprofit corporations. But a peculiarity of corporate law is that the for-profit corporation continues to benefit from centuries of precedent that made sense for nonprofit corporations. So corporate immortality is perhaps the clearest example of how the law allows the institution to have it both ways, gaining privileges of humans while eluding our responsibilities and limitations. So I use Super Sad True Love Story to argue that corporate immortality is an affront to what Hannah Arendt called the human condition of mortality. Steingart's novel is a hilarious and offensive satire of social media, sexual objectification, and neoliberalism run amok. It is also, I argue, an affirmation of the human condition in all its fragility. The overweight and neurotic protagonist Lenny Abramoff opens the novel by declaring, today I've made a major decision. I am not going to die. It sounds like a ridiculous pronouncement, but it turns out to be actually be the gospel according to the corporation where he works, selling dechronification treatments, also known as indefinite life extensions, to wealthy clients. So the corporate creed that money equals life refers to the fact that clients identified as HNWIs, or high net worth individuals, and only HNWIs can afford the indefinite life extension. So those with enough money can make a bid at living forever, just like corporations. The novel has two human characters who are associated with immortality. One is Lenny's love interest and co-narrator, 24-year-old Korean-American Eunice Park. While Super Sad discloses more, far more, about Lenny's sexual preferences than most readers care to know, his disturbing obsession with Eunice is ultimately less erotic than because she strikes him as the, quote, poster child for eternity, unquote. As he says, in some ridiculous way, I think Eunice will let me live forever. So the second human representative of immortality is Lenny's boss, friend, and part-time father figure, Joshi Goldman. But whereas Eunice represents immortality due to her tiny girlish body, Joshi does so because he's a stand-in for the corporation itself. It's called Statling Wapachung Corporation. The 60-something executive runs the company's significantly titled Post-Human Services Division and has been undergoing dechronification himself, appearing younger every time Lenny sees him. So Joshi is the human embodiment of the corporate person because of what he sells, what he practices, and also because of how he mentors Lenny. You've got to sell to live, he says. So that counsel captures the complete flattening of human life and human value to a quantifiable corporate scale. Joshi, Joshi also explains what not to do, as he says. Those thoughts, those books, they are the problem. You have to stop thinking and start selling. That's why all those young whizzes in the Eternity Lounge want to shove a carb-filled macaroon up your ass. You remind them of death. Acting, the humanities, it's the fallacy of merely existing. So in other words, stop being a human being, and in particular, forget about the humanities. So this terrifying advice captures what Wendy Brown terms neoliberal rationality, which in her words, disseminates the model of the market to all domains and activities and configures human beings exclusively as market actors. So the zero-sum game emerges most clearly when the objective of corporate immortality justifies the mass destruction of human beings. Early in Super Sad, a group of LNWIs, low net worth individuals, 
who have been evicted from their homes and have set up tents in Central Park are slaughtered to tidy up Manhattan for the benefit of the visiting Chinese banker to whom the U.S. is deeply in debt. The annihilated LNWIs are all poor and mostly people of color. While initially it seems as if the government ordered their slaughter, after a larger massacre called the, the Rupture, Lenny learns that the corporation, the, his corporation ordered both of the mass executions. His boss, Joshi, evasively admits that which citizens were chosen to live and which to die depends on their assets. And in ordering this genocide, Joshi as corporate proxy also extends his own market share. He rises Phoenix-like from destruction so severe that the collapse of the U.S. government is imminent. Um, and, in, and at this point, Joshi actually becomes the stand-in for the immortal corporation in a new way. As he sees it, the massacre of the LNWIs is just a cost of doing business. He messages executives and shareholders, cheerily explaining that the collapse of the government means great possibilities for the corporation's shareholders and top-level personnel. Creditor nations will assume control of the U.S., and Manhattan, cleared of all of its riffraff, will be converted into a lifestyle hub for globe-trotting HNWIs. And who's going to profit from that, Joshi asks. Stotling Wapachung Corporation, that's who. Property, security, and then us. Immortality, the ruptures created a whole new demand for not dying. So the vile corporate regime that considers human life and especially the lives of citizens of color expendable demonstrate what, demonstrates what Jody Melamed describes as racial capitalism. And Joshi's role illuminates how the immortal corporation literally profits from human destruction. Um, so I think I'm going to actually skip this next paragraph in the interest of time, where, where I was going to talk about another Supreme Court decision. Um, but so in addition to these cheery arguments that I have that I have just sketched, I also plan to have a chapter dealing with um, a 2011 Supreme Court decision called Walmart versus Dukes. Dave Eggers is the circle and Helen Phillips is the beautiful bureaucrat. So what I want to get into here is the relationship between the corporate entity and the individual worker specifically how the individuality of the worker is held against her in order to sustain corporate identity. And I do mean her quite literally. The protagonists of both novels are women, while the Walmart case involves discrimination against female employees. In the largest class action suit in American history, the court exonerated Walmart from the charge that male managers paid women less and promoted them less frequently than their male counterparts. So much of the court's rationale was based on the fact that Walmart's official policy prohibited such discrimination. So in other words, corporate identity was held to be more consequential than the actions of individual male managers. But when it came to the female employees' charges, the court flipped its reasoning, making the bizarre argument that the women actually could not file a class action suit because they were, as individuals, too various to constitute a class. I mean, I don't know how these people sleep at night. I really don't. <laughs> so this chapter, this hypothetical chapter, will also examine how the female protagonists in The Circle and The Beautiful Bureaucrat respond to what organizational theorists refer to as conservative control. It's a very ugly term, but it's a useful concept. So um, unlike earlier hierarchical methods of disciplining employees, under neoliberalism, employees exercise concerted control over themselves by buying into corporate values and other forms of self-management. And as the circle demonstrates, authoritarian or paternalistic corporate policies are completely unnecessary once employees voluntarily sacrifice their individuality to the corporate whole. And what I find particularly important is how Eggers envisions the corporation appropriating the language of humanity. The corporation calls itself not a workplace, but a human place. And the official policy is that at the circle, humanity is respected. And humanity, as someone tellingly adds, is as important as any stock price. So um, just one final paragraph describing um, this, my fourth chapter in, in, in sort of in, in spe speculative chapter. So I, I want to focus on Oryx and Craig and Chang Wei Lee's On Such a Full Sea. 
And both of them involve pharmaceutical conglomer conglomerates so powerful that they structure the entire social world and also sustain stratified income inequality. In Oryx and Craig, pharmaceuticals have created what are called compounds, where affluent staff live comfortably in fortified communities, complete with schools, entertainment, and a fully privatized military called, appropriately, the corpse corpse. Part of the appeal of the compounds is that they're not plebe lands where the 99% live. And Lee also examines social stratification and class anxiety in On Such a Full Sea, in which middle class workers live in rigidly structured communities called settlements. Such workers also practice conservative control because they fear falling beneath their settlement, and also because of a minuscule hope of rising above it. About 1% of the settlement population tests out, allowing them to ascend to the wealthy and corporate-run charter communities above them. Far more often, however, settlement workers fall down to the wild counties where there is no rule of law and what one might as easily be, spoiler alert, murdered in a sleepy motel or fed to dogs by a family of vegetarian circus performers. I, I just love that. And if anyone can explain that part of the novel to me, I would really appreciate it. Hilarious but bizarre. So what Lee's three populations share, the settlement charter and county uh, populations, is knowledge that they will acquire a fatal disease called simply C. So the letter, of course, evokes cancer, but also corporation or capitalism itself. While corporate ascendancy breeds the social stratification and income inequality that lies at the center of both of these novels, Oryx and Full C, <coughs> more important to, to my project is that the pharmaceutical giants in both novels actually create public health crises so that they can profit from selling drugs. And I'm struggling with how to frame this chapter, but I want to explore how the corporate body preys off of the human body and how both Atwood and Lee portray the corporate capitalist system as itself a sickness. The corporate body is diseased and capitalism can't stay alive without the people it destroys. Corporations in these novels destroy humanities in two ways, by the production of illness and also by the production of income inequality. Whether because sick people die or because consumers can no longer afford to buy pharmaceuticals, Atwood and Lee suggest that corporations are killing themselves as well as humanity, which depressingly enough sounds like a happy ending to the zero sum game. So thank you for your patience. Questions? I'm going to throw one out to Please. you. Please. Because I love Oryx and Craig. I do too. Versions that strike you as slightly different. And I'll, I'll maybe talk about that. Is that corporations, to some extent, strike from within by the genius scientist? Right. right. I think it was named right now. What? Right, right, that's right. right. There we go. And then creates this kind of um, crisis that then leaves the corporation to explode. Right. And so is that different when so, yeah. from within the corporation decides that these entities, which have been acting as humans, need to be destroyed in the same way you could destroy a human being? Well, this is, it's funny you, you say that because this is one of the things that I have struggled with because I feel that the only way I can make this, this argument is that I'm going to actually have to, in some way, be defending Craig, who's the mad scientist and a just complete whack job who, who, who destroys everything. But I mean, I think the thing that's interesting about him is that even though he absolutely is working within a corporation, but I think his motives and his interests have nothing to do with corporate motives or interests. I mean, because he's not, he's not, I mean, I, the, the whole profit thing, he could care less, shareholders, right. he could care less. But I mean, I think that I think that is a problem because if it, because if you're absolutely right, it is destroyed from within. So I mean, that's just what I'm, I mean. I, I don't think I've fully answered your question, but that's I mean, I'm aware it's a problem, and that's sort of what I'm thinking about. I, I like the idea of Craig is not really a corporate. It's really not a corporate entity. He's his own. Particularly because he's a scientist. Yeah, he's on, he's off on his own project. Yeah. Of creating a post-human race. Right. Which is another. Exactly. Thing. Exactly. I think Chris. And then yeah, I was wondering to, if you can go back to the um, free speech part at the beginning, because I think that's one area where 
the, um, the, the way in which the law privileged the corporate entity over basic, basic human rights becomes really salient, right? Because when we were doing AUP negotiations, we had some, we were researching academic freedom and we had some members saying like, why do you need academic freedom protections in a union contract because we have the First Amendment in the United States? What most people don't realize is the First Amendment basically protects you know, individual citizens from the state, right? And they're basically kind of their, their free speech rights vis-a-vis -vis the state. It doesn't protect them in the, in the workplace from their employers because employers, lo and behold, are individuals with their own free speech rights who can do things. So there's, so, so Breitbart could kind of attack Antifa as kind of free speech kind of killers at the, and without a uh, beating, skipping a beat can defend Trump saying I'm going to fire all NFL players who take the knee or, or they should be fired by their employers, right? Because that, that sense of employees having no free speech rights who work for companies or any business basically is so completely and totally normalized we don't even see it as a zone of free speech, right? Um, and so I was wondering if you could comment on that either as something that you're seeing as kind of a leitmotif in the literature or something that some of your court cases or some of your secondary sources have illuminated? Well, I mean, there's, there's, I think, you know, I certainly haven't read all of the legal stuff, but it seems to me that there has been more written about um, that particular uh, corporate appropriation of, of, of the constitutional right, the free speech right, than anything else. Um, and at one of the, the paragraph that I caught was actually about an earlier decision um, from the 70s. I, blanking on the name right now. Um, but this, I mean, it doesn't really answer your question, but it certainly is, it certainly is relevant. Let me just find the name of this one. Oh yeah, First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti. And this actually, so this was 1978, and this, this actually laid, it laid crucial foundations for Citizens United in terms of, and actually when I was, when I was talking about Citizens United, I was talking about the toxic metaphors of of money as speech and also the marketplace of ideas, but these actually go back at least to the Bellotti, the Bellotti decision. Um, and, there, and there's definitely been a whole lot written about that. And, and I think you know, corporations also have, um, I mean, I don't know if, if the lawyers read it this way, but I mean, I read it that with Hobby Lobby, they now, they now have free exercise rights. They also have, they've, they've claimed other rights like um, against, suits, against uh, search and seizure, due process, so, I mean, and I think actually a great premise for, for a, um, if anybody is a creative writer in the audience, I think a great, a great premise for a dystopian novel would be when corporations gain the right to bear arms. And um, you want to write that one? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, so I don't, I'm not really sure what to say except that, I mean, I, th there, there's, there's been a lot written about the free speech particularly. Um, and, um, I, and I have to admit, when I read Citizens United, it's it's very one of the things that's that's like that's very very fun, and very frustrating about reading these rationales is, of course, all of the justices, even when you completely disagree with their politics, they're all com they're all brilliant reasoners, um, and they do certainly um, both in Velati and in Citizens United, they do make a big point about that the Constitution does not protect speakers, it protects speech. Um, and then another thing that I think is actually relevant to your question, and I don't know how widely this extends, but I know that it does apply to Citizens United. S many of the laws that pertain to corporations also pertain to um, labor organizations because they're, I guess the law sees them as similar kinds of entities. Um, so I don't know if that gives us anything that we can use in an, from an activist point of view, but I mean, I think that would, that would be a way of sort of maybe thinking about getting some, some of this power back. But I mean, it's, it's a great question. I'm sorry, I don't have more of an answer to it. Sarah? Um, I'm really excited to hear about the whole shape of the, of the book okay. project. And um, I want to ask um, what you're thinking about legal personhood generally, um, because a lot of historical um, struggles have been fought over uh, groups uh, at lack of access to legal personhood, such as slaves. Right. And here now we have this legal personhood, this usurpation of certain kinds of legal personhood that is going on. So what, what happens to legal personhood or what happens to struggles over legal personhood in your view um, in this context? Well, I mean, I just, I just 
I think it's interesting because if people, I mean, just citizens in general, not academics, I mean, when there, there's widespread, um, like, overwhelming agreement that there should be, I mean, when people are asked, that there should be a constitutional amendment abolishing personhood for corporations. Uh, but I think the thing is, is that we don't often think about, we don't often think about the fact that, you know, because we're so aware of corporations, but we don't often think that they're people. So, I mean, I personally think that we have to somehow try to take the whole thing down. But I don't know how we could do that because I can understand, even like putting aside, you know, the fact that there are roots in, in church law and whatnot, which makes it really complicated, but I can understand certain amount of l the logic of corporate personhood, so I can understand why a corporation, I can understand why it, it's helpful to think of a corporation as a person so that they can sue or be sued and so that they can enter into contracts. And I think actually a lot of this stuff has, is very tied up with, with contract law. So, I mean, I personally would, would like to see corporate personhood defined in an extremely restrictive way. And there's actually, there's one, there's one scholar, I think her name is Steppenwall or Steppenwall, legal scholar. Um, I mean, I could definitely find the name if, if you're interested. And she, she talks about, which I think is a really useful concept, what she calls normative citizenship and that this would be something that would only apply to human beings and that this being a way of differentiating corporate personhood. And so that is probably, something like that is probably a lot more practical than my desire, which is just to destroy the, the construct, especially because I, even I admit that some of the construct serves, use, serves useful, pur useful purpose. Um, so I think that, I, I, I think it's a matter of really underscoring and clarifying the differences, because I do think that the, that the, obviously there's all kinds of reasons why we live in the present moment, in, in, the, in the current climate. Um, but I do think that this logic of shifting more and more to the, corp, to the corporate person means that we're gonna be taking away from, and especially people who don't have much access in the first place. And, and, it, and it also goes back to that the, the, the marketplace of ideas nonsense. Um, and just the fact that we, we sort of see everything in these, mar in, in these economic terms, and yet we see the corporation in human terms. I think Ashley was. Uh, yeah, um, and actually, so this is um, a kind of question about the uh, Hobby Lobby and reluctant fundamentalist chapter, and like the, uh, the um, concept of capitalist fundamentalism. Because one of the things I was thinking as I, uh, as I was listening was um, about this novel that I read in Kathy's class called Capitoil. I can't remember who wrote it. Uh, uh, yeah, I have, the novel's called Capitoil. You wrote it with um, oh, <laughs> and, and yeah, and the reason why I'm thinking about this is because I wrote about it, to be fair. Um, but like, I think um, one of the phrases in that novel that comes up over and over again is the zero-sum game. So I was actually even thinking oh, about it okay. as I was looking at your poster. Okay. Um, and, um, and I think like it has this really unique way of challenging um, the, the capitalist fundamentalism concept, right? Because it kind of, at, at, and this is what I wrote in my paper, that it kind of uh, presents this argument about productivity occurring more effectively when people work together, but in this like subtle and interesting way. So I was thinking, although it's presumptuous of me to like suggest a novel. No, it's fantastic. That might be useful for that chapter. It's um, fantastic. And it's just a good read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like recommend it. Um, That's great. It's it's actually on a pile at home, which yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have, yeah. I have it. I, so I need another sabbatical so I can read all this. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. That's that's fantastic. Great talk. Thank I'm you. sorry. We no, no, no. That, that's fine. Um, when you were, throughout your talk, I kept thinking of Mark Fisher, I guess, by way of just yeah, yeah. observation. Yeah. It's easier yeah. to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But the inevitable, inevitability of capitalism is usually because it's disembodied, because it's this force that, yeah. that, you know, and so I was just thinking that there's so much language that you called attention to in both the Supreme Court cases, but also in all of that fiction, whether it's Tom Jay's, uh, you know, the, the, the bodily language he uses. To what extent do you see these novels pushing against the inevitability of capitalism by way of the corporate fiction. See, I'm not sure if, I mean, I guess I want to think that they're pushing against it, but because so many of them are these um, dead-end dystopias right. um, that I'm not sure. But I, I, but I do think that they, I think that 
and, I, and this is something that I try to do in, in my classes, um, especially my undergrad classes, and I'm very thrilled to have Taylor in the, in the, in the in, she was in my last um, Human Cost of Capitalism class. What I try to do is to use the fiction to, to I, think the, I think the fiction makes some of these problems more obvious in a way that's sort of like an abstract concept of corporate personhood seems, seems that it's not significant. So I don't know if the novel, I mean, I think the novels are, are certainly <coughs> critiquing these things and I think giving us, giving us tools for looking at them and seeing what's, what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a, that's a fantastic um, point about the inevitability being connected with the disembodiedness. But then the, fl you know, the flip mm -hmm. of that being the, the embodied, it's a fantastic point. I'm not sure who is next. I'm like so thrilled. So many people have comments. Maybe, maybe Eleanor and then Dwight and Rachel. Then we'll go. Um, my question builds on Chris's point. Um, and thinking about unions as collective bargaining units that the phrase you use. Right. Um, and I think I was particularly thinking about this in terms of the Walmart case you cite, where yeah. like the impossibility of class action. Like, how do you define a class? And I mean, it's one of the problems with corporate personhood that it takes this aggregate model and makes a collective into an individual. And are some of these novels advocated, like in sort of resisting corporate personhood, do these novels sort of end up sort of reifying individuality as an individuality, or do they propose kind of like other models of collectivity that might be kind of like similar to corporations, but sort of fundamentally different and fundamentally more democratic, more empowering? <coughs> and more and socialists, obviously. Yeah. Well, that's that's a very inter interesting question. So, when you ask, like, do the mo models propose other, uh, do the novels propose other models? The first one I think about is on such a full sea. I think some of you have read that, mm -hmm. um, it, which has um, a collective we narrator. I mean, like, a, and it's it's actually the the people in the in the charter community, which is sort of like the the main community, and they. They mostly grow fish, um, fancy fish, which are eaten by the, the wealthy charter population. Um, so you have this, um, the, very much this collective narrator. That being said, I think there are a lot of, the narrator is not, um, there are a lot of kind of creepy things about that, about the narrator. Um, and, the, and, I, and I don't, so I don't, and I don't think the narrator is actually, um, for, for one thing it's not, I don't think it's a model for, resistance um, and the collective narrator also has this kind of weirdly voyeuristic way of looking at the central character who's named Fan and who actually sort of travels through all of these different societies. So I mean that there certainly is a, a model of collectivity um, but I'm not sure if it is if it's a model that's one to be followed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, I can't think with the other novels if there would be other models. Um, so I mean, I guess what, I think one of the things that I would love to see is, is more literature that deals with these issues that's not within a dystopian framework. Mm -hmm. um, although actually, Richard Powers' novel, Gain, is not strictly, it's not really a dystopia, although it's certainly, it's certainly very scary. But it's a great question, though. Um, kind of picks up on that sort of same topic. Um, I wonder about the distinction between corporate capitalism and capitalism, because it seems mm -hmm. like one of the implications of the personification of corporations that you're talking about in this paper is precisely that it um, allows people who would otherwise view the actions of corporations with a great deal of skepticism to see the corporation as an individual entity within a capitalist competitive mm -hmm. framework. So. For example, if you look at some of the foundational statements on how capitalism works, like Wealth of Nations, right. Smith was particularly concerned about corporations, about the chartered corporations, because they were monopolies, that because they had state power. Because using state violence, they could actually exercise power and effectively prevent competition from happening within a capitalist market. Now, I'm not defending yeah, yeah. but I am saying that I think one of the reasons, and this is one of the things that the Cato Institute has been particularly um, um, guilty of, and Murray Rothbard, and I can give you some sites on this That'd later, be great. Is, is specifically turning the corporation into a single actor in a capitalist competitive environment. Yeah. It's that that's actually allowed, I think, for a lot of people 
this bizarre model of capitalism, which isn't even capitalism as it was originally conceptualized, to, to exist, right? I mean, it's, it's completely skewed the balance of power in the marketplace, which is, goes to your point mm -hmm. about the two cents versus two million dollars um, marketplace of ideas problem. So I just wonder if n nuancing that distinction it would, <clears throat> not, not that you don't do that in the longer project, I, I'm sure you do, but I wonder if that's some of the problem is precisely turning the corporate market that we currently live under, this horrible nightmare existence, right. into something that looks at a glance like capitalism, but really isn't capitalism at all. Right. It's, it's a tyranny. Basically. Right, exactly. And I mean, and, I, and I, I'm not sure how long this has been going on, but it certainly seems that the, that we're, the moment that we're living in now, that, um, I mean, I completely agree with you, that, that the way, I mean, the, the fact that we're getting more and more of these massive mergers, and you know, and um, you know, Amazon and Whole Foods and all all of this all of this crazy stuff, that there's, I mean, I think that it's we are going to be living in this dystopian neoliberal future in like in like three seconds, where there's only going to be a couple of corporations, and so there isn't going to be the competition, because of course capitalism is supposed to be fundamentally about competition and fundamentally about individuals. I got kind of hung up on that thing that you were talking about at the beginning. Um, which I think was not your main point, but about um, turning the corporation into a single actor and this sort of individual, which I think it, maybe that's part of how the corporations um, the, the danger have the appeal. To make that distinction would be to divest what you're saying from the history of capitalism. Yeah, no, yeah. And that be, yeah. That, that's a problem too, I think. Yeah, but I mean, and I think that part of that, what you're picking up on, and which is something that uh, that I think is one of the biggest things that I'm struggling with is that I'm mostly interested in this sort of corporate form and specifically in corporate personhood, but I'm always sort of slipping around and finally I'm talking about capitalism more generally and I'm always trying to kind of bring it back to the corporate form. But then again, I, t I have this tendency to like set these really ridiculous rules for myself, like this whole thing has to be about this one thing. But I mean, I do think I, do think I, sort, of, I sort of shift around um, and I think especially when I talk actually when about this whole idea of capitalist fundamentalism, because it's actually not—it's actually not even corporate fundamentalism; it's, it's capitalist fundamentalism. But I would love to hear more about the, the Cato Institute stuff. I think Rachel, and then. Exactly. Case that's actually eroding the reproductive rights of, of really existing people. Um, I'm interested in the relation. Is there a kind of necessary relationship between these two things to begin with? But also thinking about one thing that you, you're interested in is, is kind of the, the kind of models of resistance that might be imagined to call, call into question this. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, and the, the reproductive angle, it was something that I want to get into it, I'm not, but I'm not really sure what to say about it, but I was definitely thinking about it a lot, especially with the Hobby Lobby, because it seems, it's just not a coincidence that the, the way that corporations get their foot in the door of religious rights is by curtailing um, reproductive, re reproduct women's rights over their bodies and the ability to, to make reproductive decisions, so it's not a coincidence at all. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not sure what to do with that. But I think it was very interesting how you were talking about the sort of self-perpetuating nature. Um, and I think perhaps some of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of corporate immortality, I could maybe also think through the idea of 
se of, of the self-perpetuating nature or the, the sort of the self-reproductive. Um, and then another thing mm -hmm. that, that I would, that I would um, say that's slightly in response to what you said and also maybe slightly in response to what, um, what Dwight was saying is I think, um, I think one thing that needs to be done is we need to figure out a way of, ta of redefining, I mean, so even if we're going to have these corporations, why are they defined so much in terms of the, in terms of the money interests? I mean, and I know that there is supposedly this talk about all, all of these stakeholders, but I mean, I think we need so much more, uh, so much more emphasis on the actual workers. Um, and, the, and in the Hobby Lobby decision, and you know, this whole uh, elaborate rationale for this, for the corporations having religious freedom is a way of just, of, of the only way they can, e they can even make that argument is by not considering the fact that the women who work at Hobby Lobby are also part of the corporation. I know that's off, that's off the topic of reproduction, um, but I think, it's, I think that's, it, that, that's the way to um, maybe to get at it. And one thing that I did cut from this talk was that um, Ginsburg has a has a uh, has a pretty good but slightly disappointing dissent to the Hobby Lobby decision. I mean, I'm really, I'm really glad it's there because she makes some she makes some excellent points, um, and <clears throat> sh shows all kinds of inconsistencies in the majority's reasoning. But unfortunately, she frames the the right of the women workers as employee rights, not as reproductive rights. So she doesn't go there at all. And that's the one thing that I was very disappointed. And I'm not sure why she didn't go there, but she didn't. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing for the reasons that Chris was specifying, right? Because yeah. when you're in the corporation, in the space of the corporation, you're nothing but an employee, Yeah. right? I mean, you don't have rights that yeah. extend beyond that for the same reason that you know NFL players don't have the right to Take the knee free, free speech the rights, of right? The, of the private corporation, right? Right, sir. Uh, thank you for that. I, I, I really like the idea, but I'm concerned about the phrase the marketplace of ideas. There, I'm thinking of a book I read by Lewis Menard and, uh, called The Marketplace of Ideas, and it's basically the history of, of higher education in America. And you could argue that this university is the marketplace of ideas. And you could argue that your favorite independent bookstore you know, is a market, marketplace of ideas. And although I completely understand the two cents versus two billion, you know, that argument is clear. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't resonate with the phrase marketplace of ideas for that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just think we need, a, I think we need another metaphor. And I'm not sure what it would be, but I don't, I don't, like I, I think it's really dangerous to put ideas within the realm yeah. of an economic exchange. So yeah, that so that's that's what disturbs me. Yeah. Ideas for dollars and cents is really difficult, but yeah. ideas competing against one another is not. And right. I think Lewis Menard would argue that, that that's just business as usual in American academia. Right. But then business as usual is another. So I mean, so so it, I, 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 right, I and I mean, and 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 I and and that's after thinking, you know, having been thinking about corporate personhood for a couple of years. Um, I mean, I guess I'm maybe because I am trained in literature, but I'm it just really blows me away how powerful these metaphors are, mm -hmm. and how because I think they do structure our thinking. Um, and I haven't read that book. I mean, it sounds like something that I would very very much enjoy reading, and probably would agree with a lot of his conclusions. But I just I. I don't like the metaphor, um, and I think that with Citizens United and um, and and the fact that it's you know tied in with this idea that money is itself speech. It's like just a little add on the the basis of the book is that he was trying to represent the humanities at Harvard University against the colossus of all the sciences, mm -hmm. and his experience in sitting at university level communities for about five or ten years translated into a book called the marketplace of ideas used in a positive sense. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to have to read that because actually one of the things, which sounds like so vague, I'm glad I didn't try to put it into my talk, but I think that in trying to sort of trying to make this defense of human beings against a corporate persons, I think it, it actually is very much tied in with the defense of the humanities. And if, if those of you who have read Super Sad True Love Story um, know what a big part, that what a big role the humanities play 
in that in that novel. So I think it would actually be really useful for me to read that and to see how he uses that how he uses that metaphor. So thank you. R Rachel, Jerry, well, I want to get to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I may be being too complicated here, but it's just something I really wanted to say. Please. Building off of what Dwight said and your focus on the notion of self-policing. I mean, what I heard, and, and I know your defined space is the corporation, but what I couldn't help thinking about was the intersectionality, and you mentioned it yourself, of both the corporation, if you like, and the government, when you talk about oh, Trump. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But also, I, I keep thinking about that intersectionality of capitalism and communism of the type in 1984, you know, where we have big, big brother, you know, and, right. and I, I, I just can't lose that sense of the, the self-policing as being something that just does, you know, have an intersectionality with other key modes of thought, I mean, that whole Foucauldian notion, you know, of the panopticon, and right. I wondered whether you were just going to, you know, maybe mention it briefly and then define your your space elsewhere, or whether you would include, you know, that thought of communism as self-policing, or, you know, I, I just wonder if other people Yeah, no, I, I, um, no, I've been in a sort of a rabbit hole with this. My sister is actually an organizational um, psychologist, so she gave me all these ci all like all these citations, and um, <coughs> and and I've been slowly reading through them. So I've kind of been in like the rabbit hole of the way that organizational <coughs> theorists think about it. But I think you're absolutely right that I should um, take that idea and connect it to things that are certainly much more uh, familiar and important to people to people in the, in the humanities. Um, and th because you're right, the self policing occurs in a lot of a lot of a lot of different arenas, and, and has been theorized by a lot of people. Exactly. And it makes me very happy that um, I'm going to be teaching a, a dystopian, a class in dystopian literature in the fall, I think it's in the fall, for, for, under, yeah, for undergrads. Um, because I, but it, and of course, it's sort of the same thing as my human loss of capitalism class, but in a different, in a different guise. But I'm going to include 1984 because I haven't read it for 20 years at least. And I really need to go back to it. And now you've made me that much more excited to go back to it. Jerry? So I just want to say thanks, first of all, for the presentation. I thought that was great and really informative and very exciting project. But I just want to um, say I think the perspective is really a good one for using the law against literature. Because I think what that is going to allow is a, a nice comparison of ideal capitalism and really existing right. capitalism. So you see, when, when um, right. um, Dwight mentioned you know, that competition is the law of capitalism, I, I would disagree with that. In, in, I'd say that's the ideal of capitalism, but the reality is that capitalism is about accumulation. So you know, we could say that the, co the corporation comes about as a, as a natural you know, part of what David Harvey calls a, as a regime of accumulation right. at the monopoly stage. So this is capitalism. This isn't some deviation from capitalism. Right. This is what capitalism becomes at a certain level of development. So that, that was one point. And then the, the question I wanted to ask you was that I think one of the things that's interesting about the, the ideal model of capitalism that we see in the Supreme Court rulings about you know, agents in the marketplace and the equality that's presupposed in all of that is that it essentially creates a kind of fetishistic view of reality. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And you know, we talked about, you know, Marx talks about the, the fetishism of commodities. And, and I'm thinking, would it be helpful to you to think about the fetishism of, co of corporations? Because we have, in a sense, what, what Marx was getting at was that, that this is a kind of primitive mythology, but it's, but it's dressed up, obviously, yeah. through the price yeah, system. Yeah. And basically, what we have is a kind of primitive mythology. Right. If we're saying that these entities are like people, that's absurd. Right. But, we, but we act like that. Right. So we're, right. we're just like the people who believe that if we throw bones on the ground, the rains will come. Yeah. You, see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that was really interesting. We're, yeah, yeah, we're yeah. living in an irrationalist social world. Yep. So that's what the literature is showing us. Absolutely. What, what do you say to that? That, that, that? That's where we are. We live in a world that is actually, that is actually mythical. I totally in, agree. In a complete sense, with mystique and obfuscation and magic and all the rest of it. But, it, but obviously, it's also a tragic world. I mean, what I would, I would say, I totally agree with it, but I love how you put it, because I wouldn't have thought of putting it in those terms. There, there is um, a book that um, there a scholar who I use who I find absolutely fantastic. He's a political economist. I don't know if anyone else here has read him. 
Um, his name is Martin Koenigs, and he has a fairly recent book called The Emotional Logic of Capitalism. Mm -hmm. And this, you've read it? Yeah. Read yeah. It. And the, the <laughs> subtitle, the <laughs> sub. <laughs> So it's, it, so it's on your list like Capitola, or it's on your pile like Capitola is on my pile. But the, the subtitle is What Progressives Have Missed. And what he um, basically is writing about is, and it's, this is very useful for me, especially in dealing with the fundamentalist thing, is, that, is, is the idea that capitalism has become, um, it's, that his emotional lore is, is the same as that of a religion. And he has this whole, I mean, he, and his argument has a lot to do with the difference between idols versus icons. Um, but so I've been thinking about that issue through him, but you're absolutely right that I should think about it through Marx and talk about fetishism and, and the fact that it is completely irrational. So. And also to get at um, Adorno and Horkheimer, mm -hmm. you know, the really new age of myth. Right, right. No, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Well, so um, coming a little bit off of that, and this might be a little bit in left field, but thinking about the return of religion, at least in Orange and State, and I think yeah, yeah. There's the return or the creation of this sort of collective ego spirituality, right? And if you are thinking about the university versus the individual, I wonder too if the environment is showing up at all, and sort of the return to nature, however we conceive that. Because if there's zero sum game, is one of life, death, immortality, all of that is still premised upon the existence of an earth, which the corporations right. are right. rapidly destroying. Right, right, right. The sources. Yeah, and so I know in, in the sequel to Oryx and Craig, there's the, the green gardeners. gardeners yeah. yeah, the gardeners, and then in the Butler, there's um, Earth and Red Dark part of it. So I'm wondering if that's showing up in other places or something that you thought about. Um, I, think it, I think it's super important. I haven't. I haven't really done much with it, but I, I, I also think of um, the road, which doesn't really deal with the corporation, but I mean, I think it's very much within this, within this tradition. And there are <coughs> moments like when the, the boy and the man <coughs> find like a Coke bottle. And so, the, I mean, there are, there are moments, and, and there's, a, there's a scene where he picks up some coins and they're completely irrelevant. So, I mean, there are allusions to the fact that the whole capitalist thing has been destroyed, but that somehow the, like the, the earth is still there. So I think of that, and also, well, I was just going to say, yeah, on, on such a full sea, and I don't know what you were thinking of, but I was thinking of especially like the fish and the water yeah. um, being so being so important, and the, the and fish the as a, when they want to revolt and they right. throw crap in the pond. Exactly, um, and but the, the but the fish are being raised um, as a commercial product, but then the main character Fan has a relationship with the water and with the fish, which seems much more sort of organic and authentic. Um, so I think that, that it definitely is something that, that is connected to these other issues in, in some of these books. So, but if you think of any others, please let me know. Bob and Haley. Uh, fascinating talk, and I'm really excited about this project. Um, I was thinking so much as you were opening up your lecture about the scene in The Grapes of Wrath, which probably a lot of people remember, when um, I think it's the Joe, I think it's Pa Joe who wants to go shoot somebody who's taking his land away from him. And there's this whole chapter about there's nobody to shoot. You can't find a human yeah, body yeah, yeah, to yeah. shoot because yeah. the corporation has no body. Right. And I found that I don't know, yeah. I've always found that to be an extremely powerful scene. And I'm wondering if it does seem like a lot of your project involves bodies. Right. It, it, it does seem that the corporation, because of its bodilessness, or it's 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 a corporation, which goes back to the word for body, of course, but it does has no body that can be wounded, that can starve, that right. can die. Right. So there's some central. Right. I, I don't know. It just seems to me that you're really onto something with that kind of embod how bodies work and how the corporation claims to be one without one. Right. It, right, right, right. There's so many contradictions layered on top of each other that it's, that it's pretty maddening. But I just think you're getting at a lot of really great fundamental things. Well, thank you for mentioning that, that scene in Grapes of Wrath because that is that is perfect. And it's and it's been kind of one thing that's been just sort of ironic is that in you know get trying to get my I, you know I got into this because I wanted to read con contemporary literature. I didn't know I was going to end mm -hmm. up writing about any of this stuff. But in the further I got into contemporary literature, then I want to write about this. But then of course it turns out. 
that I have to go back. <laughs> so, so many, and uh, but particularly go back to the progressive era, which is where I, you know, worked for like the last 30, 30 years of my life. So I'm like, I want to get away from it, but I, but I can't. But yeah, I need to go back to the Grapes of Wrath, even though I hate that book. But maybe I'll maybe I'll like it now. You've given me a reason to to look back at it. And Kaylee and and Patrick and Kathleen. So I apologize if this is off topic, but no. I absolutely loved your talk. I want to thank you. Echo Bob there as well. Um, this made me think of something that I talked about with my students today. So it reminded me very much of Hollingsworth v. Perry, the Proposition 8 case, um, in which the state wouldn't go to appeal it or go to appeal it, so they had corporations step in. Um, and at the same time, kind of towards the closing testimony, the, the question became about whether or not marriage benefited the state if it was between same-sex couples. Um, so the idea of like having to reproduce and whether or not reproduction could happen organically and naturally became a question that was kind of falling apart there in the way that it was defined. Um, and then this gets fictionalized into Dustin Lance Black's play A, which is just a recording of the court transcript with some narrativization in there that is then used to get money to fund additional legal causes for this. So it makes me think of this kind of weird symbiotic relationship between literature and law that you're really getting at, and this mm. idea of like, how the individual is both supporting the state and how the corporation is stepping in on behalf of the state. It doesn't necessarily fit with corporate personhood, but it's definitely kind of knocking on a lot of doors. Oh, no, in my that's, head. that's fascinating. Hollingsworth, I, I haven't read uh, this. Versus Perry. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that, sound, that sounds great. And you, you said that a tr the transcript was made in. Yeah, the closing test, uh, the closing, um, was it closing arguments, I think? It's um, Dustin Lance Black, and the play is just named Eight. That sounds great. Thank you, Haley. Patrick. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to build off what Bob said in terms of like a corporation doesn't have a body. It can kill, but it can't murder because it doesn't have that consciousness or conscience and therefore right. it can't meet the uh, malice requirement of first degree murder. Also, it can't be killed in any form of punishment. It really just gets passed on to the consumers because fines exactly. are about the only thing that can exactly. be done. Exactly. Kathleen and Brandon. This is just a quick kind of like medievalist <laughs> thing. Um, so, uh, I was thinking that telescoping history that you can do um, might really find useful, and I'm sure you already know uh, Kantorovich and the King's Two Bodies, where really that first whole chapter kind of digs into the canon law and kind of how this idea of kind of a corporate role um, around a political corporate role kind of emerged. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that that made me think about was that Kevin Law really thinks about <coughs> ethics of labor, at least kind of the really old mm -hmm. stuff does. And it's very skeptical of profit, um, particularly usury, as White knows. But um, it's, it's very interested and invested in kind of how we use labor and, and the outcome of what we do with that kind of the excessiveness of profit. Um, but now we're at a moment um, where we're really talking about the ethos of profit. Like we're, we're moving from the ethics of labor to the ethos of profit. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking particularly um, like the ruminations about Steinbart's book, um, which Super I really like, and, uh, and yeah, and, and Gain. Gain is interesting because it's kind of, it stops just short of, of our current moment where you have these right. really abstract kind of forms of labor like Facebook and Google, which have these <coughs> ethos attached to them in a really personal way. Right. And so like Mark Zuckerberg, we just learned that he has like $7.5 million in personal security right, for the last year and a half, <laughs> because like Zuckerberg as a personality is so important. Right, right, right. Um, And that company kind of makes money, um, as does Starbucks, as does Google, through these like weird kind of, not ethical appeals, but like ethos appeals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, um, right. And so like Google's do no harm. It sounds ethical, mm -hmm. but it's really about right. an ethos. It's right. about profit making. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. So that, that slip is really a, a sort of, it's seamless, and it goes by really fast, but it relies in a weird way on this idea of, of kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, right, absolutely. Yeah. And there's there's a, um, an American Studies book, I don't know how far back it goes, a couple couple decades, I don't know if you've read it, Chris, called um, Creating the Corporate Soul by Roland Marchand, which deals with with um, probably like, I, I think probably maybe like 1940s through 1970s and like huge corporations, but trying to Make themselves look better, and a lot of it, a lot of it, focusing on advertising and like lots of glossy pictures and stuff. Um, but it would be, it, it would definitely be worth my while to sort of think that through to the, to the present moment. Um, well, and the way that collectors can police back 
so that you yeah. know you have have uh, the Parkland kids say, you know what, if you advertise um, Laura Ingram, you're going to lose this many customers. So that becomes a, a, yeah. a way of fighting back a, a you know one corporate a corporate identity that says it's something is being policed by people who are who right. themselves now have a, co a collective by way of followers. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, and I have not read the King's Two Bodies, so thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, that first chapter. No, it sounds great. It sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. I want to stop the conversation. No, no. That would be our last question. Uh, then, so you formally ask Claire to answer questions. I'm interested in this. Definitely. And Sarah actually told me about this wonderful conference that um, meets every uh, March in uh, Georgetown. That's a law, law, culture, and humanities conference. And I got to tell you that the law professors are so much nicer than English professors. I mean, <laughs> present company excluded. But you know, you go to conferences and like somebody who's like a big shot will like not make eye contact with you. But uh, these people were were so fantastic. So so that I was kind of getting my foot in the door that way. But I absolutely want. I mean, I always tend to sort of publish kind of like outside of my field a little bit. And so it's very important to me that this stuff isn't just, you know, my making, my, my making the stuff up. That it, and, you know, that, and there's, there's so much that I don't understand about the law that it's, that it's really kind of intimidating. Um, but yes, it definitely is going to be interdisciplinary, and I definitely want lawyers in on it. Well, if you have questions, I'll urge you to ask them informally to Claire and to have some more food and coffee and drinks and stuff over there. Unfortunately, no vodka as far as I know. <laughs> but um, and thanks. Let's be clear. Yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> thank, you for your, thank you so much for your patience and your wonderful comments and questions. It was super helpful. Appreciate really it. Interesting.